Hi, everybody. Uh, hi. Welcome to the uh, ENACT Forum on Women's Political Engagement. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm David Weinstein. I work uh, with the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life here at Brandeis. And I coordinate ENACT, which is the organizer of this event. And uh, before we introduce our guests, I just want to say a few words about that program. Uh, ENACT uh, is the Educational Network for Active Civic Transformation. It's a new national program engaging students at colleges and universities in state-level legislative change uh, by learning to work with legislators, staffers, and community organizations to advance policy. So it's a national expansion based on the model of Advocacy for Policy Change, a model course that many of you here are in, uh, and program for civic engagement that since 2010 has engaged Brandeis undergraduates with the legislative process on key state level issues. Uh, that course is taught by tonight's, today's moderator, academic program director for ENACT, Professor Melissa Stabell. Uh, ENACT courses are being taught in 16 schools uh, across the United States, and this year we're adding uh, 13 more for a total of 29. Um, the course is taught by faculty fellows in 29 different states. Uh, so you can see the full list online. Students, faculty, and alumni of these courses, and that includes anybody here who is in that course, uh, can network together and are sharing ideas, resources, and questions with each other. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce uh, Massachusetts State Representative Jay Kaufman, who will introduce our speakers and moderator. Jay Kaufman has served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives since 1995 and is capping a career in leadership education by launching a new nonprofit organization, Beacon Leadership Co Collaborative. Uh, to provide leadership education, mentoring, and professional development support for those in and aspiring to public life. Uh, and is, he is a member of the Ethics Center's International Advisory Board and serves as distinguished legislator for the ENAC program. And I should note that his education includes both an undergraduate degree in philosophy and a graduate degree in history, both from Brandeis University, as well as an MA in history from NYU. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you for introducing me to, in turn, introduce uh, the people who are here this evening or this afternoon uh, for their incredible value. Um, I will be extremely brief. When Melissa, st first of all, I've had the honor of working with Melissa for close to a decade now. Um, first developing the advocacy course and then developing an act. And I love to have had the bit parts that I've had in the in both of those programs, and treasure the active and ongoing engagement with all of you and with uh, folks from around the country who are now part of the ENACT network. So Melissa, thank you for that partnership and thank opportunity. You. When Melissa asked me to come up with a couple of names of people who I thought might be appropriate for this forum, it was actually a very easy answer. Uh, the two women you see in front of you here with Melissa are two of the people who I have on my wall of heroes and heroines. Um, people who have you know, put the best possible face on public service and the best possible face on public leadership. Uh, the, Terry Norelli, to your right. That's the first time you've ever been accused of being on the right. <laughs> um, Terry uh, is a former Speaker of the House uh, in New Hampshire and was president of the National Conference of State Legislatures for many years. Um, exhibiting not only enormous leadership capacity and skill, but also just a, a real openness uh, to thinking about things that hadn't happened before and asking why not and making change happen uh, and doing so in a way that wasn't at all threatening to most people, but it actually an invitation to change, which is not easy to do. So Terry is just a, a remarkably wonderful person, um, and I think you will really enjoy her here this afternoon. And then Sidney Friedman, sitting to her left, um, and that is appropriate, um, is a newly minted state senator here in Massachusetts, uh, still in her first term. But if I could predict the future, I would predict that you're looking at a future Senate president in front of you, although <laughs> it's going to take convincing her uh, that, that that's the case. But I'm on her case. Um, and I can't encourage you enough to uh, engage with these two and these three remarkable women, uh, not only for what they have to offer as women, but what they have to offer as human beings and as people who care deeply about uh, the quality of life that we have as a community and as a country. So with that, um, I'm turning it over to you, Melissa, right? Thank you so okay. much. 
So we're so honored to have both of you here. And um, I would like to use this opportunity to really almost informally interview you and ask questions that I think we all want to know the answers to get to know you better, but also through you to get to know the legislative process at the state level better. So maybe we can all have more impact at that level. So anytime uh, members of the audience have a question, just raise your hand, the mic will come to you. And if you could just take a moment to identify yourself and then ask your question, that would be perfect. So, and, and please feel free to raise your hand at any moment. To your, we will not be interrupting. So because we're at a university, let's start maybe at what did you study <laughs> in college? And did it have any relation to politics? And maybe at what point did you find yourself getting interested in politics? And maybe do you want, Terry, do you want to start? <laughs> OK, so how many of you love mathematics? Uh, really? Okay. I taught high school math, um, and uh, when I left that to take a break, um, I was actually recruited to run for the New Hampshire House. Um, I would say that probably most women today in the legislature, whether it's in Massachusetts or New Hampshire or the US Congress or any other state, probably most women were recruited to run. And they were, did you see somebody shaking their head no when Jay said you're looking at the next Senate, you know, a future Senate president? That's because that's what we as women, unfortunately, tend to do. And so it takes a few times encouraging. But the good thing to say about what I majored in is that you can become an advocate about any issue at any time with any kind of background. And that's what's important. And one of the reasons that I was recruited to run was not my professional job, but my volunteer work, which for decades was advocating for women, whether it was um, with uh, rape crisis centers or with NARAL New Hampshire, um, for women's right to make their own reproductive health care decisions, or, but for many years advocating on behalf of women. And that's uh, why I was recruited to run for the House. And why I said, not why I said no, but I did say no three or four times before I finally said, I suppose I could try it for two years. <laughs> um, I, uh, what I majored or studied in college was the art of making sure that I never had to sit in a classroom. Because <laughs> I had gotten to college and said, I am so done. Um, I didn't meet the mold of kind of the education that was being presented you know, in the 60s and in the 60s. And so I really had this need to get out and do something. And um, what captures me is being involved and engaged in solving a problem. So I, uh, so I, was, I did not study politics. I studied education. Um, what I remember in my undergraduate career most uh, clearly is marching um, against the Vietnam War working for McGovern on my first uh, political campaign, and um, doing everything I could to just do something, get something done, feel like I was part of something. And um, like Terry, I, I went to graduate school. I got a degree in special education. I was a teacher for um, five years. Then I went into high tech, uh, ended up in high tech for 20 years managing hardware and software groups. Um, and, but like Terry, I spent an enormous amount of time in my community. And that's really how I got engaged in, in the political process, realizing that what happens in your communities is more important almost than what's happening at, at the federal level. So your school committee people and your selectmen and your mayors and your state reps and your state senators and your governor are all people who have so much more influence over your life than, in a lot of ways, than the federal government. So uh, my, my way into politics was circuitous. And like many women I know, I ran lots and lots of campaigns. Was never the I was never the candidate, 
but I ran lots and lots of campaigns. So I'm curious, do you feel more comfortable, or did you feel more comfortable being behind the scenes than in front? Absolutely. What about you, Terry? Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, it was, uh, th which I would also say, um, women tend to have a little bit more challenge in my generation. I certainly hope that's changing with your generation. Um, being sort of the, not just the center of attention, but having your voice be heard, being perhaps attacked, no, I don't mean physically attacked, but attacked in the press or, you know, people speaking out against your opinion. Um, women tend to take that a little bit more personally than men do most of the time. Um, and so it is a little bit more challenging to be the one that's out there with the voice, uh, trying to convince people that, you know, what you're trying to do is the right way to solve the problem. So how did you deal with you know, feeling attacked or that, that thing that is, it can be really, I think, challenging. How did you personally deal with that? You know, some people hide a little bit, but you didn't have that really opportunity to do that. So how do you handle that? Well, I, I mean, I, I, for me, the way I handle it is I um, have a really clear idea of what I want to know about and what I don't want to know about. So. If you are somebody who needs to read, if you are Donald Trump, uh, you, you handle things a certain way. What, what my mantra always was, if there's something I can do about it, tell me about it. If there's nothing I can do about it and people are just being nasty or throwing you know, dirt, I, I don't want to know about it. Because there's nothing I can do and it just adds to my um, it just adds to my anxiety, but it doesn't add to getting the job done. And especially in the world that we all live in today, anybody gets to say anything anonymously. And for all you know, it could be the same person saying the same thing 700 times. Um, it's just, you just have to, I have just figured out how to deal with it in a way that keeps me sane. And that is, I don't need to know everything because it's not helpful. So do you think you've developed a thicker skin? Yes. Well, no, actually. I think what I've developed is the ability to let it happen and go on with my work. It's never comfortable. It's never, it never feels good. Um, some people are very good at separating themselves and saying, wow, that person has a problem or that person has an issue. It's hard to have people say things about you that especially aren't true. That's what I find the hardest. What about you, Terry? How do you handle I it? Think, well, I think one of the most important things to remember is that um, politics is about relationships. And the more positive, constructive relationships you can build, then the more support you have around you. And that means really reaching out to people who don't necessarily share your point of view um, in a respectful way. Now, I will admit, I was actually uh, approached the first time when I was asked to run for the House 22 years ago this month. Um, and things have changed enormously in those 22 years. Um, I watched it change in the New Hampshire legislature. 22 years ago, I had a lot, I'm a Democrat, 22 years ago I had a lot of Republican friends in the legislature. Today, that doesn't happen as much. People come in, they've got their attitudes, they aren't thinking about compromise, they aren't thinking about building relationships, um, but I contend that that's really, really important. And I just uh, was having a conversation at lunch about women legislators, and one of the things that we were commenting on is that women legislators, um, data shows, tend to have a broader array of co-sponsors on legislation. And so there were plenty of times that I would be doing something and know that there were people with a very different attitude or a philosophical uh, viewpoint than I had or somewhere very in a very different place on the political spectrum, but that for different reasons might want the same outcome that 
that I wanted, and I would reach out to them and be able to work together for that outcome. That way, the hope is, my hope was, um, not that I thought of it that way, but I think it, it, it tends then that you don't get attacked as often because you've been working with people from across the political spectrum. Unfortunately today, that's not the case. Um, and, and, and actually, one of the things that helped me was that my husband was actually more upset when the newspaper came after me than I was. And so it actually helped to bolster me up because I had to, okay, it's okay, dear. You know, I can handle this. Um, it, it's still tough, but you do just have to sort of sort out what's true, what isn't true, and go on and make sure that you are being um, as thoughtful, as respectful, as honest um, as, as you can be. Um, and I've found that those are the, the, the best policies to help me through that. So Terry sort of is addressing this issue about how to deal with people that have different, differing opinions. I wondered how you handle that. Like she seemed to say she reaches out to all different people having all different kinds of opinions. And I wondered how you deal with that because you're in the legislature now right. and, and it's different maybe now. Well, it, it, it's funny because in Massachusetts, because we are uh, such a um, imbalanced state in terms of our party affiliation, uh, the Republicans in the Senate are, are actually, for the most part, pretty congenial. And we are very different in how we think about things often, but we um, have good relationships. So we come together on lots of issues. and. Um, you know, this is a really hard thing for me. Uh, so b before I say that, so what really drives a lot of what happens in the Massachusetts legislature is advocates and interest groups. Um, and the fact that because we have so many Democrats, we run the whole gambit from very, very liberal to very, very conservative. So there are, there are many Democrats in the legislature in Massachusetts, and I think Jay would back me up on this, that in a lot of other states would be Republicans. Um, and sometimes that's even harder because you're not expecting the kind of response that you get on certain issues that you feel are very democratic bread and butter issues. Um, what's, uh, it's very important for me when I'm advocating for something to know what the opposition is. It's probably the most important thing. When people come to my office and they, and they, they advocate for something or they lobby for something, my, one of my first questions is, well, what's the other side saying? Because if you don't know what the other side is saying, you can't really be a good advocate. You need to know what, what are the issues that people are, are um, addressing or what are the issues that they have, and you've got to be able to respond to them. My biggest problem is not when somebody disagrees with me. My biggest problem is when someone's dishonest. When somebody takes an issue and either says it's not a problem, or we didn't do that, or no, 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 you misunderstand me. And um, a really good example I'll give you is I do a lot around mental illness and mental health and substance use disorder legislation. And when an insurance company comes in and starts talking to me about how deeply they care about their members and how they want to ensure that they have wonderful health care, and you know that you've just read a report that says that they're asking all of their social workers to give back money that they paid to them because they found some tiny little thing in some guideline that the providers didn't follow. So now they're make, it's called a clawback. They're asking for their money back. And they're sitting there telling you that they're doing everything they can for their members. That's what's really hard for me. So I really try and get to a level of, can we be honest? Can you actually tell me what the fundamental issues are? And, um, and so that's what I really try and go after. What's the truth? What's the underlying issue? Because then I feel like I can do something about it or not, but at least I can have an, a, an honest conversation with somebody. So let's get to sort of when advocates come to your office, what really moves you 
when an advocate comes? Like, what is the way, what is the best way that an advocate should approach you, Terry? Well, from my perspective, I think it's come and identify a problem. Um, that's the most important thing. Sometimes you'll hear things like, this legislation is trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. Um, and those happen sometimes. So come to me and identify for me exactly what the problem is, and then talk to me about the solution that you are proposing and why it will solve that particular problem. I would say those kinds of, in, in that order, explain the problem, what your proposal for solving it is, and why your proposal uh, will be effective. Um, and then talking about things, um, ad advocacy groups you know, in New Hampshire and elsewhere uh, do have a lot of influence. Of course, they have a lot of knowledge. They've been out working in the field. So for instance, um, in New Hampshire, if legislation came up around, uh, let's say, uh, a choice issue, then I would always want to know, well, where does Planned Parenthood, where does NARAL, where does ACLU, where do they stand on this issue and why? Because they're out there in the field, they have information. In New Hampshire, we don't have staff, um, and so it's really important to get that information because we're the you know, we don't have our own staff to help gather that information. Um, so those are some of the things that I would look, look want to know uh, before I move forward. What about you? Well, I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that um, you said. And then it's also having, being really knowledgeable about your subject and knowing that, um, and again, knowing what are the issues. You know, well, if, I, if I listen to you, I don't want to walk out of my office and get slammed by some piece of information that I didn't know um, that was sort of really germane to what the issue was. Does that make sense to you? And, and, and kind of knowing that. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to be an expert on everything. And you can certainly walk into the office and say, I'm a constituent, and I just really care about this, and I want you to support it. Um, that's fine. And personal stories are great. Putting faces and names and, and, and real lived experience to an issue is really important, um, especially around issues where we're dealing with people who are most vulnerable or don't have a voice or you know, don't, have the, don't hold the power stick. That, that's really important. Um, but for the advocates, for people who are really there to advocate as, as experts, you need to know your subject and you need to know both sides of it. Is I would add to that though, thinking about it, and I was talking about it in terms of um, very often there are advocacy organizations that drive legislation. And so um, I was answering that way. If you're thinking about an individual who wants to advocate in support or in opposition to something, I would echo and underscore a thousand times personal stories. Um, you can send emails, you can make phone calls, you can show up in the offices of legislators or in the committees. However you communicate is less important from my perspective than what you have to say. And if what you have to say is some canned message from one of those advocacy organizations, you know, we know it's canned because you're not the only one that's delivering it to us, right? And so the most important thing is to talk about why you hold the position that you hold, whether you have your own personal story or whether you just have information that leads you to the position that you hold. Sharing your own personal story is the most important. Can you talk about maybe a story that moved you? Is there a recent story that, because we talk about this in class, is sort of how to convey that story and the importance of that to you as legislators. And I wondered if there was one that stood out to you. So I had one today. Um, we had a, um, there was an advocacy day on the, uh, in the Massachusetts legislature today uh, for NAMI, National Association of Mental Illness. And they were, as a group there, 
to um, advocate for a couple bills that are before the legislature. And one of those is a bill that, um, that is a concerns training police officers um, to deal with people who are in the middle of a mental health crisis or um, having a substance, a substance overdose, um, something that we up to, up to now have treated as a, as, a, as a crime and are now moving toward this notion that this is an illness. And so when you're dealing with these people, you need to be, deal with them in a very different way. And there's a lot of data out there. Anyway, one of the people who spoke and who I was talking to was a 17-year-old. He has schizophrenia. And when he's seven years old, he started hearing voices in class. And he went, uh, he started running down the hall to find his brother. And the security guard came after him and started yelling at him. And he, of course, was hearing voices that was telling him the teacher was after him. He just kept running. Security guard caught him. He hit the security guard, the security guard dragged him down to the nurse's office. The police came, shackled him to a chair, and put handcuffs on him, and started yelling at him to calm down. And when you sit and think about a seven-year-old being shackled to a chair and handcuffed, don't you just want to stand up and say, OK, Where's the law? Where is it? I'm coming after these people, and I'm not going to stop till that never happens again. And you know, it was such a it was it was such a to the point story. And then after he's done telling the story, he says, "So here's what I would like the police to do: take your sunglasses off when you talk to us. Don't yell at me. Can you turn the sirens down? I mean, all things that were just beyond responsible, beyond reasonable, just like." Just to the core, that story I stick, sticks in my brain. And when I'm doing, when I'm talking or I'm writing legislation, that's what I think about. So that's a, an example that um, has certainly moved me. One of the, um, I had two letters that I had received uh, in particular that I shrunk up and my husband framed for me to put over my desk to remind me all the time. Uh, why I was doing what I was doing, particularly when, when on those days that you felt like you were beating your head against the wall. And if you do any kind of advocacy work, whether you serve in an elected capacity or not, there will be days that you'll feel like you're knocking your head against the wall, right? Um, but you just keep going. And sometimes you just need that reason to keep going. And I had sponsored uh, an increase in the minimum wage and got a letter from someone who earned the minimum wage that heard me on the radio. And just reading that person's story and why um, it was so important to her to get just that little bit more. Um, she was a, a single mom as many people who earn the minimum wage are, um, you know, and just how critically important it was to her. And those kinds of stories really can um, move you to action. Uh, many of you may have become participants in this program because there is some issue about which you're already passionate for whatever reason. Um, and sometimes every once in a while, you just need to remind yourself of that, of why it is that you're advocating. Um, and I always saw myself as a legislator, as someone who was advocating, because if you're working on legislation, there's somebody that's being affected by that legislation for whom you're advocating. You know, I'm struck as you talk about how what appears to me to be sort of a fearlessness by of both of you, and I wondered if um, you know there were times that you were nervous or afraid or you know have questioned the competency that I think a lot of women do have that question a lot of times, or people have that issue, and I wondered how you dealt with that. Um, all, all the time, <laughs> definitely all the time. Um, I told you I was recruited to run for the House. I couldn't run away from the uh, person, the woman who actually was serving in the House at the time. 
um, that recruited, that tried to recruit me. I couldn't run away from her fast enough. Um, the first time, or the second time, or the third time that she asked me. What finally flipped me um, to, to saying, yes, I'll try it, was because of the advocacy work that I had done for all those years, she said, you know, this is the work that you do. You advocate for women. And being in elected office at the state level, you'll get to continue to work on all these same issues. It's just a different venue. And it will have a statewide impact. And so, um, so in the very first instance, which was my fear of running for office, it was just the work that I had always done that got me over that hump. But I think that um, these things happen often. Um, when I was, again, recruited by my colleagues to run for speaker, um, and I said no um, more than once, um, what got me over that hump was just the fact that I had a group of colleagues around me that said, you are the person that we think can do this, and we are going to be here to support you. So I think particularly for women who like to be collaborative, who like to have support around them, having colleagues that are doing whatever it is that you're doing be supportive of you is really important. Although I will say that um, uh, since I never really expected to be speaker when I ran, I mean, I was technically running for speaker, but really since there hadn't been a Democratic speaker in nearly a century. I didn't really think I was running for speaker. I thought I'd end up being the minority leader. And when it got really close to the election, and you could start to literally feel it in the air, and I realized that not only did I have the votes from my caucus to be the caucus leader, but that meant that I was going to be speaker. Um, I will admit that I woke up in the middle of the night one night and um, I wasn't exactly crying, but I was a bit um, shaken. And my husband woke up and said, you know, what's wrong? And I said, I can't believe what I've gotten myself into. And he started laughing. And I said, don't laugh because I'm not in this alone. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know that's, the, well, maybe you, maybe you don't, maybe it's an old-fashioned saying, but behind every great man is a woman, right? Um, well, really that support, whether you're a man in that kind of position or a woman in that kind of position, again, having somebody there that will support you. And I said, don't laugh, you're in this uh, as well. And there were many times that I thought back to that. There were many times that I said to him, do you remember when? And he would laugh again. But um, you know, I think mostly what kept me going was just the work that I was doing, and not the work in the sense of you know presiding over the session or running the house or you know trying to get other Democrats elected, but the work of the legislature, the policy work, the um, you know when when we passed marriage equality, when we past Medicaid expansion, when we, I could go down a list of things that I can say made a difference in people's lives, that's what kept me going through all those times that I doubted uh, myself that kept me going. I think the work is really important, like that you care more about the work than you do about how you're feeling is, is really critical. And when you can point to something that says, that's the work, that's why I'm doing it. It's not about me. Um, that's a really important piece for me. The other piece for me is that, um, you know, I've always felt like I couldn't do it. I wasn't good enough. Everybody in the room was smarter than I am. Um, I wasn't, I'm not articulate. I don't have the experience. Um, I think the only thing that's changed is that I'm better able to have that voice in my head telling me all those things that I can't do and having it be there and just saying, okay, that's the voice in my head telling me I can't do it. 
Okay, now wh what's the next meeting? Who, who am I supposed to talk to? What am I supposed to write? You know, it's kind of, I, I used to think I had to get rid of it. Now I just think I just have to let it be. It's kind of like, thank you for sharing and then moving on. And that has been a lifetime of work. I can't lie. It's been a lifetime of work. And sometimes I'm really good at it. And sometimes I feel like someone's thrown me in the water. Yep, coming around. Yeah, maybe if we can have the microphone in this area ready to roll. If you can identify yourself. Hello. Uh, for, my name is Max. Thank you so much for coming. We really, all really appreciate it. It's nice to hear this common story that the thing that matters most for legislators and for people that are involved in that work uh, that prepared them the most was actual advocacy work rather than any particular kind of school, excuse me, schooling. Um, and it seems like you know just the thing that matters most is being driven to advocate for change. Uh, but in the transition period, when you transitioned from advocacy and community work only towards actually you know like doing the job, uh, was there anything else that you wish you had done to prepare for that? And is there anything else you would uh, give us as advice to prepare? That's a good question. Really good I question. do remember because I was not. Um, involved like with the Democratic Party or anything like that um, before I ran for the legislature. So I distinctly remember when I was first serving on committee, I had my paper there where I was constantly taking notes and not necessarily about the policy or the information about the bill, but like who are the, it's a whole new world, like who are the players? Um, what role do they have? Who has the influence? What's everybody's name? You know, how does this whole thing kind of work? Um, and so I might have um, spent some additional time trying to figure that out before I ran. Um, I, I do know that uh, in New Hampshire, around I, about the time that I finished, I was getting near the end of my first term when I realized, and I had said to Martha, the woman that recruited me, I had said to her, I can try it for two years. Um, 18 years later, I hung up my legislative hat, but um, I realized close to the end of that two years that it really, that was the dumbest thing to do, was only to run for one term, because I was just starting to figure out who all the players were, how everything was done, you know, how I needed to be more successful in this, uh, in this realm and, um, and that I needed for sure to run again in order to make use of all the knowledge that I had gained. I was also able to use that whenever we had freshman legislators who, because that's also about the time that it gets really tough, I don't know why, um, and they would start thinking, I don't think I want to do this again. And maybe because they hadn't been very successful in their first term, right? They come in, they don't know, you know, you, people come in especially if they have an agenda. And I don't say that in a, in a disparaging way. You know, many people run for the legislature because there is something that's moving them, some issue that they want to work on, right? And so they come in, they sponsor legislation, they haven't done anything to figure out how, what's been filed before, why hasn't it been successful if this same, you know, sometimes freshmen come in, they file a piece of legislation that's practically identical to the one that's been filed for the last six terms and never passed, right? So, you know, why, why didn't it? What's wrong? Where's the opposition? What, so I wish that I had had um, maybe more of a mentor at that time to help me figure out some of those things earlier on instead of it taking me practically a whole two-year term before I could figure that out all on, all on my own. Um, you know, I, I guess I have a slightly different take. I, I think life experience is really great for a legislator because there's so many things you deal with um, and, and so many different aspects of a particular um, issue that I find that if you have different life experiences, you, you're better at kind of navigating that. 
Um, being a staffer is an amazing thing to do. It's really, I think, one of the, in the Massachusetts uh, legislature, it is, you want to learn how things work, you'd be a staffer. Because you will, they, they totally know what's happening. Oh, because we have staff, I mean, Massachusetts legislature is a full-time job. They have staff, the Senate has, each Senate office has a number of staff. And so, um, and the legislature, in the House, depending on what your uh, role is, that's, you know, the number of staff is commensurate with that. So it's a, it is a little different um, because, like, I could, I could find people who, you know, when I staffed the office, one of the things that I did was I figured out who, who was a staffer and who I could hire, you know. So that's really important. Um, but, you know, everybody brings something different to it and so to the legislature, and they bring their different life experience. It's, but you just have to want to work. You have to... You have to think it's important enough to take it seriously, and then you'll be fine. I mean, you'll, you know, listen to other people and you'll be fine. So I don't know if there's any specific thing that will make you ready to do it um, other than having some experience of the actual body that you're going into. I would add to that that it's also typical for women, and I think uh, you heard Cindy say this before. I didn't think I was qualified or experienced right, yeah. enough. Or I don't remember exactly how you said it, but that's typical for women. Um, if you have a man and a woman equally qualified, it's much more likely that the man's going to say, I can do that, and jump in and do it. And the woman's going to say, oh, I can't do that. You know, have we to have to more. know 150% yeah. before we think we're able to... Um, you know, to, to move forward. So one of the things that I always found myself saying to people that then I was trying to recruit because, and of course it, it flipped, um, was that whatever your experiences are, whether you're, um, you know, a parent, you know, moms tend to be the ones that are there in the schools with their kids, that are, so they know something about the education system, right? They tend to be the ones that take their children to the doctors. So they know something about the healthcare system, right? They're the ones that are out there volunteering on various organizations. So for me, you know, volunteering at a rape crisis center, I knew about that issue. And so I didn't need a political um, background to do it, as some people might think. You just have to look at what's in your background to know how, what is in that background that I can carry forward to help me to do the job that I need to do. And I would wholeheartedly agree that a varied life experience would definitely be valuable for that. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Amok? Uh, hi, my name is Amok. Uh, I'm a student of Professor Stimels. I'm from India. And uh, my question, of course, has to do with the various, uh, as, as women in politics, uh, there's, of course, an assortment and, uh, of challenges that you face. And, uh, it is a, and it is extremely pioneering in one sense to enter a field like politics when it is not at all welcoming, has <laughs> a certain uh, Machiavellian characteristic attached to it. And, of course, politics is dirty in, in essence. Uh, but my question has to do with the other players in politics that you have to deal with. Because there's, it's one thing to you know enter politics and wanting to promote uh, women in politics, and another to convince others who you'd be working with, other legislators, uh, advocates, uh, pressure groups, and so on and so forth, to get them to uh, be convinced that you're as good as your male counterpart. So if, could you please you know, elaborate a little more on those experiences and how once you entered the field of politics, how did you deal with uh, you know, convincing the other players that you're as good, if not better? I don't know if I've done it yet. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to think about what I, if, we've, if I've had successes, like why I've, I have had those successes in the legislature. Um, so one of the things that's really important, I find, is reputation. So if you're seen as somebody who works really hard, um, is pretty straightforward, um, is you know, decent to other people, you're 
you're friendly, you're, you know, um, and you're not out there to make it personal, which is a real problem in politics, okay? People start to trust you more and you start to build those relationships. And once you build those relationships, that's when you can get people to, that's when you get more influence because you have people who trust you, you work with them on issues, you don't die on every hill, do you know what that means? Like, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good, that kind of thing. Feeling like people, like you're doing something for somebody, like you don't, you don't have to take the credit, which is e much easier for women than it is for men. But it's, it's a really good tool, right? I don't care whether I get the credit. I just want the thing to get done, damn it. And if you need it to be yours, then go ahead as long as I can get it done. So I think those are some of the ways that you deal with, that you increase your influence because people, fundamentally people trust you. And when they trust you, they're much more willing to work with you and to give you what you're asking for because they feel like there's a win-win situation in it. So I think that's, the, that's what I have found to be the most useful. And I don't get along with everybody. I don't. Okay, there's just some people that I see them walking down the hall and I just turn right around and keep walking, you know, because I just, it's hard for me to hide my, my feeling and my passion about certain things. But that really is, when I watch other people and I see of anything that I've done, that's the way that I, I think it's been most effective to get people to, to do what you want. In my particular case, um, I think it was really just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, when I ran for the legislature, uh, having served on some social service boards and having been a teacher, I thought the most logical place for me committee-wise was either you know, education committee or health and human services. Or, um, but somebody in the legislature had a different idea. Um, the ranking Democrat on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee called me up, and this was at a time where um, electric restructuring was a big deal nationally, and it was a particularly big deal in New Hampshire. And it wasn't something that most people were really that interested in learning about. They just, they, there was a problem, they wanted it solved, they didn't want to be part of the group that most of them that had to do any of the solving. But the ranking Democrat called me and said, um, I hope you're going to ask to be on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. And my response was, I know nothing about any of those issues. And guess what? His response was, but you are a math teacher. <laughs> As if, right? right? Um, but I, but I, I, I let him talk me into being on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. And then I felt all of a sudden like I had gone to graduate school, right? Because I had to know all about restructuring. So we had um, electric issues, we had telecom issues, and we had air pollution issues. Although before that was, just a little bit before that became a big deal and everybody wanted all of a sudden to be on the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee, right? Um, and I talked to a lot of people, I built a lot of relationships, and I studied really hard, as a lot of women do, right? Because that's what makes us feel secure, is knowing everything. So I studied a lot. Um, and after uh, the end of my first term, the ranking Democrat actually ended up running for the Senate, and the leadership, the Democratic leadership came to me, and I'll add that the Democratic leader was another reason, simply because he was someone who um, really supported uh, me as a new member for whatever reason. He was supportive of women in general. Um, and so there were a few times, even during the first term, like um, there was a, 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 an issue that was brought up, not impeachment, but we have something sort of below impeachment for a j judge, and it took a special committee in the House. And so the Democratic leader asked me to be the person from the Democrat 
from the house to serve on that. And I thought, okay, that sounds kind of interesting. Again, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds interesting. I'm open to opportunities. I think that's really important. Um, and so no sooner did I say yes to that than um, the, they needed to work on negotiating with Northern Utilities around the plant in New Hampshire. And we needed a Democrat, a Democrat from the House to serve on that. And they said, will you do that? Fortunately, I said, I can't do both. So you pick. I'll do one or the other. And he said, well, you're on the Science Tech Committee. We want you to. So I actually ended up at the very end of my freshman term being um, on a very small six members out of the House and Senate that were negotiating with not th just the legislature, but the governor and the utility company and everything for how we would um, move forward um, with the Seabrook power plant. Um, and so, I, I mean, it truly was just being in the right place at the right time. And then I had this opportunity to do what most legislators never get an opportunity to do, and that was to be right in the thick of an issue and being a really important player in that issue. And that gave me an experience that, I mean, that really took me forward. And so I became known as someone who was really well informed about this particular issue. And so people, not just Democrats, but Republicans as well, would come to me and say, give me the, you know, the short version of why I need to be with you guys on this. And I think that people would come to me because they knew that I would tell them everything about it, not just, I think you should support it because all these good reasons, I would say, some people are going to say and give them the other reasons that people, and counter those, but make them aware of it. And so I think people saw me as somebody who was kind of a straight shooter. You know, I would tell them like it was, whether I wanted their support or didn't want their support, they knew they could get the actual information from me. So there, so there were, I'd say, three things from my being in the right place at the right time, being a straight shooter. And then the other thing I was told from other people um, that they thought really benefited was that I really only focused on a few issues and became the go-to person on those few issues. And so as opposed to some people who come in and they're like out there on this issue and that issue and that, and so they don't really become an expert or the spokesperson for any particular issue. Is there another question? Savan? Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sivan. I'm in Professor Stimmel's class. I'm, it's been alluded to a few times and hinted at, but I'm wondering if you could speak more to the gender dynamics of being women in politics and what that looks like and how that manifests itself. Um, yeah, that's basically my question. <laughs> and maybe along with that, if you could sort of talk about if you have maybe a cohort of female supporters, or did you have a cohort of female supporters within the legislative body, and if that was helpful or not? Um, Cindy. Uh, an interesting statistic is over the course of the um, history of the Massachusetts legislature, there have been 190 women 40 in the Senate, the rest in the House, and there have been over 20,000 men. So take a deep breath and contemplate that. Um, people are very respectful of me, you know, especially right now in the Me Too movement. People are, you know, especially on, on guard and on their best behavior. Fundamentally, the system is pretty male oriented. And there's just, just no getting around it. It's, it's in the walls, it's in the floors, it's in the seats, it's in the, it's kind of a way of looking at the world. I mean, to, to your question, I mean, one of the things that we can't forget about is 
it is about power in that in those institutions people are there yet yeah, we all have great intentions but if you want to see humans on pecking orders and you want to go back to middle school you want to be institutions like that bring out that kind of human drive which is all part of our DNA to have power and control and so it's it's you it's noticeable to me the kind of way the system set up it's it's very hierarchical it is not by nature a team sport um, it's I, I felt I I felt very much for a while I would be sitting, I've been on some key committees since I've been there, and it was really interesting how often I felt that the guys were talking over me. You know, that there was a conversation like this, and I was here in the middle, and I'm kind of like saying, let me, wait, let me, and I just, and I actually asked, uh, there were some other women in, in this particular group, and I said, do you, get this feeling like I'm being talked over or talked at and they said oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> happens all the time um, now because recently the Senate has had a woman speak a woman president and um, there's now going to be another woman president uh, people are on their best behavior and part of what it is is you've just got it's like your kid right you can explain to them so much, and then you just say, stop. Just stop doing that right now. Just, I don't want to hear it. Stop doing it. Don't care if you understand. Just don't do it. And I feel like we're almost at that point that it's just we have to change people's behavior by just not having it be OK that they act a certain way, not trying to understand it or, you know. Um, so that's kind of that's my experience as a woman. Um, I do absolutely. I will be talking to people. My chief of staff is a man. I will be talking to advocates, and they will be looking at him. And he will be going, "Yes, Senator Friedman, what do you think about that?" And they'll just keep talking to him. And I thought I was crazy. And I said to him one day, I said, do people look at you when you and I are standing there? He goes, yes, I'm so uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. That's why I keep saying Senator Friedman, Senator Friedman, yeah. Senator Friedman. And that's the kind, that's what it feels like. Um, and it's easy, I mean, it's wonderful that Terry was on the science committee because it's really easy for the women to be delegated to the positions of the humanities. You know? Oh, well, but remember, I said nobody really wanted to be on the that's science right, that's committee. Right, that's, right, that's right, that's right. That's the other way you get on committees when no one wants to be on them. But you know, but that's all what it's like to be a woman in, you know, um, that, that's my experience of what it's like to be a woman. And it's a fight, you know? And you, you know, and part of it is, is you gotta figure out how to fight. You know, you get, like you have to figure out when you need to grab the power because otherwise people aren't going to listen to you and when you don't care about the power because it's going to get in your way ultimately. Those are really hard, those are really hard things to figure out, I think, as a woman, right? We just went through this thing about where we had it, we, we have a new Senate president. And when we realized that we were going to be voting on a new Senate president, we spent the last two months as a body talking about who was going to be the Senate president and who was going to support who and what it would mean if you went out earlier. What did it mean if you went out late? What did it mean if you picked this person and that person won? When should you tell people what you think? I mean, it was, it was, it took all the air out of every room you were in for two months because it was about power and who was going to coalesce around the right power and who was going to coalesce around the wrong power. And that was really, difficult for me because I just you know I like to walk in get things done leave you know but you got it you got to figure out how to play those games if you want to be successful Terry um, I would just add a, a couple of things and certainly the numbers game is a big part of it right uh, somebody said to me at lunch today doesn't New Hampshire have an all-women federal delegation and yes we do and this is the second time that we have in uh, well, the second time that we have, they've both been recently, um, but they, they give people, I think, the false sense that in New Hampshire, you know, there's not a problem with women 
in politics. Like, they're all women at the top, so you must have a lot of women. And the answer to that is no. And sometimes it actually feels to me like, I wish we didn't have an all-woman delegation so that people could really see what's happening um, down ballot, shall we say, because no executive, we have a five-member executive council, they're all men. Six legislative leaders in the House and Senate, they're all men. The percentage of women in the House, New Hampshire used to be very high, sometimes highest or second highest in the country for the percentage of women, usually up around maybe as high as 35 percent. They're down around 25 percent now. So um, the numbers game is really important. And what that means is you have to recruit women, consciously recruit women. Because what I have found, even among younger women, because I'm still involved in recruitment, um, particularly of women these days, um, even among younger women, they still have this sense that, you know, I, I, I'm not good enough, I can't do that, or, you know, whatever way you tell yourself, you know, that's not for me. Um, and so we must actively recruit women to run. That's number one. Um, I, I also think that uh, you talked about having people around you as support. That has been hugely critical for me, particularly once I was speaker or even running for speaker, having a group of colleagues, men and women, around me who were supportive, that I could turn to, that I could lean on, was really important. Um, I think Cindy mentioned before about the fact that the legislative um, polit political environments tend to be very hierarchical, when in fact women tend to be much more collaborative. Right? And so the system's set up this way, women tend to work this way, and so you have to find your own way of working this way. The other thing about that is that when you think about leadership qualities, we tend to think of the kinds of leadership qualities that men have as being the defining qualities that make you a leader. When in fact, there are a lot of amazing women leaders with a very different skill set that need to be acknowledged as leadership qualities. So you might be interested in reading a book called Leadership, the, I think it's called Leadership the Eleanor Roosevelt Way, um, because what it does is talks about what kinds of qualities Eleanor Roosevelt had that made her such a dynamic leader, right? The last thing I would say is if you really want to know how it's different on the campaign trail, there are plenty of books that are written um, that probably would shock you because you see it all in a condensed space. Um, about the sexism and misogyny, not just of Hillary Clinton, but of Sarah Palin as well. And there are plenty of books written about that if you want to see what's really going on out there, that even we as women, because we're so used to hearing it all the time, kind of just let float by us, that are not acceptable, that need to be changed, but that starts with awareness. Sage. Hi, uh, my name is Sage Rosenthal, and touching upon the question that Savan asked, I was wondering more where we're at right now, the dynamics um, and interactions um, about being a woman advocate. And um, I know in my own personal advocacy experience this semester with Professor Stamel's class, um, all the key players and all the people that I've really been communicating with and having conversation with have been women, and um, I'm not sure if that was luck or that was the topic that I was doing, but I would love to hear she about your experiences. So. Yeah, I'm working with children's mental health um, and uh, like for, and Rep Balzer from Massachusetts was one of the sponsors and also with the children's yeah. mental health campaign and other women that 
um, my partner and I have been communicating with um, have been women. So I was just wondering if you could touch upon that. So, what, but what's the question? Why do you think that is? Or um, what, just about it? the dynamics and the experiences of being a woman advocate. Um, if there are, um, you know, dyma dynamics that could be improved if women are seen, you know, more in the um, advocate error, like as opposed to being a legislator, um, if there's a gap between going from advocate to legislator, just similar to um, those dynamics. So maybe how does yeah. a female advocate get her point yeah. across? And, and be successful. Is there, is there I, something I about that? I would start out by just validating what you're saying. Um, it is true. Look at the if you've been to any of the marches, I assume some of you have been either to the Women's March or to the March for Our Lives or to any other marches, look around. That's predominantly women, okay? Advocacy, roles in organizations, predominantly women. Um, legislators, not so much. So I would, first of all, validate your sense that it is mostly women that are doing the advocating. Um, and then I would say, from my perspective, women tend to be the helpers. Women tend to be the caregivers, right? We take care of our kids. We take care of the sick person. We, you know, so our role particularly in our generation, is much more about um, caretaking and advocating for that person for whom we're taking care. So if you're taking a kid to the doctor, advocating for your child, right? If you are, um, you know, in, in a school setting, advocate, again, advocating for your child. So you, um, we do it as part of our everyday lives. Um, and, and again, this is changing. I am hopeful that it will change more than it has. I kind of thought every once in a while I think it's changing more than it has actually changed. And then I talk to young people and find out that it hasn't changed as much as it needs to. Um, so, guys, that means, you know, we put the pressure on you to be out there and advocate as well. And we put the pressure on you to support and encourage the women that you know who would make great leaders to step up and be those leaders. You know, I'm still not quite sure what are you are you asking like how do you make that move from advocate to I'm just curious if there is a gap and as your experience as a woman advocate if you felt any you know pushback if um, you felt there were greater difficulties if there is any okay. uh, yes or maybe not so uh, for me I think it's this really is a kind of economic issue okay as um, uh, Terry said, they, women tend to come in and be the advocates for, uh, for the human services, okay? And we don't, we give a lot of lip service to human services, but we don't, we don't really value them because if you look at where the money goes in most of our budgets, it ain't to human services. Even though they might get a percentage of that budget, um, they, don't, they don't hold the power. And um, in fact, there are some studies that say as medicine becomes more, uh, you know, single payer socialized, more women go into it and the men leave because, the, 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 because of money, okay? So it's really, um, what I see as the problem or the gap is that there are many incredibly strong, powerful, smart women who are out there advocating for other people but it's, but in somehow it feels like it's less, people take it less seriously because women are doing it. And oh, you're here because you're, you care and you know, you're all emotional and you know, these are all really emotional issues and stuff. And so I do see a real, um, it's almost like you're, you come in with a hand tie behind your back. And, um, and I do see that and um, Again, I can't stress enough how people, 
they're, they get attracted to power. So who people, when you feel somebody that has the power, um, that's what people tend to go toward, especially in, um, in elected positions. Um, and so one of the things that you have to figure out is how you bring that sense of power, how you bring that sense of importance to somebody that you're talking to that's going to make a decision about it. Like what's in it for them? Um, what will it do for them? How will, you know? And, um, and that's a lot of what you have to do as an advocate. Um, you've got to explain why it's in their best interest to listen to you. And it is definitely hard because you're often talking about things that while people say they care about it, it's not where the power center is. You know, if we, if we paid all of our social workers 150 bucks an hour, you bet that the whole dynamic would change, right? Because that means we value what they do enough to to pay them in a way that, that signifies that value. When we're paying people 20 bucks an hour to take care of the most vulnerable people in the state, you're not coming from a sense of power. You're coming from a sense of moral rightness, but it's not what moves the world. And so figuring that out, and it's figuring it out as a woman, right? Because my bent really is I, I just want to do I want, it, I want balance in the world. I want the people who don't have a voice to have a voice. I want there to be some equality in how we make decisions. I want decisions for the lowest you know, people on the economic spectrum to have weight as the highest people, Nick. I mean, I'm not, and I really care about that, and it really matters to me. And I want to fight that fight because it's morally right, it's economically right, and it makes us all safer, okay? But I got to figure out where the power is, and I got to use it. And women can't be afraid to use their power. Um, there was a question that you asked about how do you get people to listen to you? You be the speaker of the house, and people listen to you. Because why? You have power. And so I think our job as women is to figure out how to keep our values, how to care about the things we really care about, and how to work in a system where we need to exert our power and not be afraid. And just remember, there have been men, billions and billions and billions of men throughout the centuries who have grabbed that power, who have done a horrible job, who have ruined the world, who didn't know everything, didn't have a clue of what they were doing, and they did it. And they didn't sit around and say, oh God, I don't know if I can do it. I don't have the right skills. I'm not sure. They went out, made a fool of themselves, messed things up, did it wrong, got humiliated. They did all of that and it didn't stop them. And that's what I think women have to start thinking about. It's okay if you don't know everything. It's okay if you make a mistake. It's okay if you're not the smartest person in the room. It's okay if you make it up sometimes. That's okay. That's how you play the game. And I think women need to do more of that so that, that they can get, then get to a place where they can say, all right, but we don't want to do that anymore. Let's, let's, let's do this the real way. So it's, I, I hope that answers your question. So I think that's a great way to end. We are out of time. And I just want to thank you both so much for your honest, insightful comments. <laughs>